Alrighty, looks like we are live. Welcome back everybody, I'm Scott. This is Drawing Together with Artist Network, where we meet every Wednesday to draw together. Um, this is what we're working on today, this doorknob with these metallic reflections, and I have to say this was wicked hard, so <laughs> let's, let's see how we do today. I've seen some comments coming through that kind of suggest that this is a bit of a challenge. Um, so I just wanna welcome you all back. It feels like it's been forever, so I'm really excited to see everybody here. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to call them out in all caps during the chat. And if you're new, um, you're gonna wanna know that you can find the reference image in the description below. You'll see a bit.ly link that where you can bring up the image. That's the one that's right below me here. Um, and you can bring that up full size and you can draw along with me if you'd like, or you can watch the recording after the live uh, episode. So um, this stays up on our YouTube channel where you can follow the chat um, and you can follow along. Um, also go to artistnetwork.com where you can find the drawing together pages. Again, there's a link in the description. Um, each episode has its own show page where uh, a lot of you have been sharing your work and it's really awesome to see all of that. So Thank you for sharing your work. Um, and in particular, I really like to hear when things are going well for you, when you might be struggling. You know, not don't you don't have to just share only your successes. I think it's really helpful for everybody to share sometimes the uh, the challenges that we all face. So um, I'm not seeing any questions here, um, but I do see some. Uh, I do see some comments again that allude to this being a challenging subject. Um, uh, my goal throughout this uh, this drawing together episode is to try to simplify it and hopefully make it a little less intimidating. Because my general belief in drawing is that you know you we learn a set of of um, concepts, some skills, techniques that are that are kind of specific and inherent to drawing itself, not in particular to a specific object. So the, the way we tackle drawing a, a simple subject like a cup, those tools that we use there, we can apply to more complex things like this. It's the same set of decisions that we make, just um, in kind of finer degrees than others. Sometimes we're looking at big shapes, sometimes we're looking at small shapes. Um, and sometimes a more complex form can actually be easier than a simple one. We talked about that with the cup drawing. The more things you have going on in a drawing, the, the less critical each element in individually becomes. And the more simple a, a drawing, the more critical each individual element becomes. So um, Cindy has a question here, Scott, which Hanamula paper do you use? So far, I've only been able to get the Nostalgy 90 pound natural white. Um, I am working today with the Schizen 190. So this is 190 pound um, natural white paper. Um, they ship this out to me. I So I, I don't know exactly where um, to buy it, but I really enjoy it. Any smooth drawing paper I think will work for this. Uh, today I'm actually going to be working with charcoal, so I've got my two HB pencils and a 6B. Uh, I've got my two erasers, actually I want to make sure I keep my 6B separate. Uh, I've got my kneaded eraser, my plastic, or if you have a rubber eraser. And I also have this one, this mono um, sand and rubber eraser. It's generally, it says it's designed for ink and pencil. Um, it's got a bit of an abrasion to it, um, and that can help to um, kind of lift off if you're having trouble with the material kind of sticking to the paper. And then of course I've got my handy uh, blending stump here. So um, what size paper, uh, so this again this is the Hanamula um, paper though it's so it's sized a little bit differently but it's essentially eight and a half by 11. I like to work nine by 12 so if you're in that range that you're going to be able to work kind of one to one and I believe I sized the um, the reference image to fit on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. So it's about an eight by 10. So if you're eight by 10, nine by 12, I think that's gonna work for you. Um, this Now this, this uh, initial drawing that I had, had done to help me kind of work through some issues is a little bit smaller. I kind of, I made the doorknob a little bit smaller. Um, where I'm going with this one is a little bit larger. You can see I've already started it to some degree and that's because I spent a lot of time just building up charcoal in this and because there's so much intricate work happening here in the reflection I want to make sure that we have enough time for that. Um, so I kind of skipped ahead. This is pretty kind of simple here. All I did was build up a tone of value and my goal is to get rid of that white. Um, so uh, oh, we've got some questions here. I want to get back to that thought but let me see if I can address some of these initial questions first. Um, Let's see, I don't have an HB in charcoal. I have a 2B, 4B, 6B. So Joy, if you are, any of you, if you're working in graphite, I think a lot of these 
um, uh, the processes will apply to graphite. So use whatever material you have. Um, if you if you want to try to follow along as closely as possible, uh, I think if you have the 2B and a 6B, that's going to really be close to what we're working with. An HB is a little bit harder, but a 2B is going to get you there. And then I like to have the 6B for really some of the, the darker values when I need to really push that, that tonal range in the drawing. So um, hopefully that helps. Okay, and as you can see, I also have it laid out, some of these initial proportions, but I do want to talk through some of the things that I was thinking about here. Um, so I built up this tone, getting rid of the white, um, because as I did that preparatory drawing, it became really clear to me that it's a challenge to differentiate the, the values of the highlights. Um, and at a smaller scale, or if you squint at the subject, it becomes clear that there's a highlight right in here, uh, right in here, and then right in here, where the light is strongest. And I want that to be the brightest white in the page. And then everything else is going to be darker than that. When I started this drawing here, I started with that white of the page, and I was constantly battling that. And then I was gradually trying to build up the tone in the background, and it became more of a challenge than, than I think I needed to uh, you know, have it for me. So this time I'm going to try toning the page first, and then I'm going to erase out those highlights um, and, and control the value that way. Now one of the things we've talked about throughout this series is that the, one of the challenging things that we have to address when we're working with value is that we're constantly calibrating to that. So uh, my mind wants to treat this as white, even though it is that gray. So once I start to erase up the highlights, that's going to um, really help me to see the true value range. Um, uh, Nia is asking, is there a reason why you chose charcoal when graphite looks more silvery overall? That's another good question. So we're dealing with a metallic subject. So it makes sense to use graphite that is a bit more metallic in nature. Um, and honestly, I don't know as if, um, I didn't, I didn't choose not to use graphite. <laughs> I think I chose to use graph, uh, charcoal because it, it's just a material I enjoy working with. And it, 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 it gives me the challenge of creating like these crisp, clean lines that are more, it get a little bit easier to achieve in graphite. Graphite lends itself to that precision. And so I wanted to give myself the challenge to work in, in charcoal and I wanted to make sure I could push the value range as far as I could. Um, so if I look at the subject matter, I see areas like right in here in these, these holes here and this reflection or this darker kind of reflection in here, um, how dark that gets. And then right in here, it gets really dark. So I wanted to make sure that I could push that value range as far as possible. Um, now, I, you know, some of those things I, I, can, I can look back in retrospect and say that that was a good choice for me. Um, at the time, it was kind of just a, a hunch that the charcoal would work better for me um, in that regard. Um, so I did choose a smoother paper uh, than a kind of a rough charcoal paper because I, knowing with these reflections, having some of those crisp lines is going to be helpful. So, um, all right, we'll get back to it. Laying out the basic proportions. I We've talked about this before throughout the series that um, there are kind of two ways to initiate a drawing. You can initiate it uh, through the use of line or you can initiate it through the use of shape. I, I chose to initiate this in line, estab establishing the contour lines first um, so that I could kind of separate thinking about the form from the reflections themselves. The That's one of, one of the things that I see um, in and some drawings of reflections where it seems to be a challenge for me is what I see students do is get so focused on the reflections that it overwhelms the over form, overall form and we, we, don't, we kind of lose sense of what the form of the doorknob actually is. So in this way, I'm trying to think of first just what is that basic form, looking at the contours, I'm gonna build that up and then essentially build the reflections into that if that makes sense. I, I, my initial instinct when looking at this is to trace out all of those lines and those sharp reflections. Um, but if I do that too early, I feel like I'm gonna lose the form and the, the basic structure of the doorknob. Um, and, and one of the things I like to keep in my mind is that you know when, I, when I'm looking at a real doorknob, something that's reflective like this, I don't question its form. I understand its three-dimensional structure. And the reflections almost become secondary to that. Um, and I want my drawing to reflect, you know, be 
kind of built the same way. I don't want the reflections to be the first thing that I notice about it. So, um, so Mary, yes, you have a good question about circles and ovals. And I want to kind of talk through how I established this. So I, I use some basic comparative measuring. So what I first wanted to do is find the relationship between the width here and then the height. So kind of envisioning the, this, um, this ellipse here um, and noticing that it's a little bit narrower on the top. The height is shorter than the width. Um, and you can use your comparative measuring tools here. So I have the reference image in front of me, using my pencil to gauge uh, the distance of the, its height, comparing that to the width. Um, and so the overall height here is equivalent to about the width from this edge to this dark spot here, this hole. Um, and the way I like to tackle these ellipses is first establish the, the outer perimeters, the, the parameters of that. And then you start to break it apart into sections and then gradually kind of piece them together, if that makes sense. Um, and throughout that, I'll also take larger kind of swipes at that as well. You can see I have this, this kind of overhand grip, I'm locking my wrist. I'm drawing more from the elbow and the shoulder here to, to create a... Um, to create a nice smooth arc, you know, because we have this natural curve to the wrist that it, we, it, we can rely on, um, and you want to kind of use all of that. So kind of break that into sections, try to piece them together, try to get fluid marks, and then also utilize the curve of the wrist when you, uh, when you can. Now I like to use the, the shoulder more as my kind of pivot point when drawing because this curve here really lends itself to only a few marks in this where I'm kind of aligned in that way. Um, and then otherwise I'd have to rotate the paper and then I could, you know, it, that would help me kind of create these curves if I, could, if I were able to kind of rotate this and keep using the natural pivot on the wrist to create those curves. But because I have this tape down, I don't have that possibility. So I really have to rely on that shoulder movement uh, to create those curves. And then, and one of the things that, that I really struggled with in the preparatory one is that my mind wanted to make this um, plate here a circle rather than an ellipse. Um, and in part because then the doorknob itself being a sphere is a, is a, is a true circle. And in my mind is just trying to compare those two. I know that that's a circle, but it's in perspective. And so because I'm looking down at it in an angle, it actually squishes it a bit and it makes it more of an elongated ellipse. And so take some time to really measure out the relationship between the width and the height and make sure that you're not forcing it to be a circle when optically it's not. Um, and that's the, that's the, the challenge in perspective is is that there's the, the literal truth of this, is literally this plate is a circle, but optically it's an ellipse because of the angle, because of the perspective there. So, um, so I had this already kind of laid out, I kind of worked out those proportions. The other thing that you wanna look for is, are these intersection points right in here. So if you know that this is a circle, really determine where, you know, what point along the circle do, do these curves intersect with that circle. So, and if you, if you do that, that helps you to place the ellipse here properly relative to the circle here. Um, and then you can also gauge this vertical distance here. Uh, if you take a measurement, um, this distance here is equivalent to about one and a half distances, you know, compared to the height of the, uh, that, that front doorknob portion. So hopefully that makes sense. Just some kind of tools that I use. There's a lot that kind of goes on and you always want to be checking that. Uh, now that I have this mapped out, I want to keep in my mind that I need to keep adjusting this as I notice things are off and don't trust that this is correct. Um, I'm going to continue to refine as we go. Uh, oh, uh, Ahmed is asking if I'm using one-to-one -one ratio in proportion or do you make the drawing big? So that's essentially what you're referring to is the site size. So kind of essentially keep the, the drawing the same size as the, as the reference. And it's pretty close. Um, I'm, the, in this one, I intentionally made it smaller. Um, and I feel like that worked against me. 
So in this one that I'm working on right now, I'm making it a little bit larger and it's more aligned with what I'm seeing. So I have the reference image on a screen up here on my left where I'm seeing all your chat as well. So that's what I'm using as my reference and then I'm using the screen that you're looking at has the overhead camera that allows me to see um, the drawing directly and, and without any sort of perspective distortion. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Uh, now that I, so with, with everything kind of built up like this, just kind of, I've got, I've built up a tone, I've kind of mapped things out just a bit, I want to start to do a little bit of negative drawing and map out that highlight. And what I want to try to do is do my best to understand the three-dimensional form. Imagine this wasn't a reflective metal, but you know, just a solid paint, for example. There wouldn't be any reflections, but there'd be a clear highlight and a shadow side on the sphere. We can see the light coming in from kind of this direction, dropping into shadow in here. And I'm trying to make some of those mental observations um, as well as some major kind of observations about highlights and shadow. So I can use my kneaded eraser to pull out the general shape of the highlight. Um, one of the challenging things here is I feel like that reflection is higher up, but it's actually very low on the uh, on that doorknob there. I'm not going to erase out the door shape here. There's a bit of a highlight here. So I'm just looking at really the sharpest lights in, uh, in, the, in that drawing just to get something on there. And now I'm gonna to start to block in even farther. So a lot of squinting. And what I notice is that this general shape in here is relatively dark in value. So I'm gonna drop this down. And my, my approach to this is to, again, not get bogged down in maintaining crisp lines. What I, what I see students do and in an instinct that I'm fighting myself right now is to, my instinct is to map out all those sharp edges where the reflections are. Uh, and in, it, when I, in the past when I've done that, my drawing has tended to fall apart. Uh, it, it loses its underlying structure and all those deal, details project forward. Um, and it kind of ends up flattening out the whole drawing. So the, the process that I'm gonna use, I'm gonna keep you, you know, thinking about this subject just like I would any other drawing where I'm keeping these edges intentionally soft and I'm gonna gradually sharpen them throughout uh, so that I'm maintaining a sense of unity in the drawing. So I don't want this to be a, a, a series, kind of a, essentially a patchwork of, of marks that, ha that are no longer attached to an underlying structure. So still fairly gestural, using the side of the pencil because I want the material to scrape across the surface. Makes it easier to erase. That's why I'm using this, this side, kind of this modified kind of overhand technique. And looking for those big shapes. So squinting my eyes a lot, moving back and forth between the reference photo and the, uh, and the drawing. You remember, you know, the drawing for me is it's 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 about the emergence of the subject on the page. We're pulling the image out on the page, and so I want to work the whole drawing. You know, and, and again, one of the, the the things about drawing together is that we're all here sharing our own experiences. So if you have a completely different approach, I hope you're trusting that. And just using these as food for thought for yourself. This, is, this isn't the way to draw, this is the way I draw. And that may be different from yours. So I'm gonna keep trying to move throughout the drawing. And what I'm observing are the, the areas of dark. I'm not going to be careful with this edge. I'm going to, I'll be using my eraser quite a bit to sharpen up some of these edges. So I feel like, you know, I feel like for me, my, my suggestion is to, to try not to be too precious with the edges. 
Um, you know, one of the questions I get a lot is, how do you keep your drawing clean? And I, my answer is, I don't. <laughs> it just, you're constantly kind of adjusting and moving it. And I just, I know, I've know from my own experience that when I try to protect certain areas of the drawing and keep certain areas clean, it ends up becoming so much of a distraction um, that it, I really, it, it doesn't become an enjoyable drawing experience and the drawing itself kind of falls apart. So I've just kind of learned to work into the process and understanding that this whole thing is just going to get messy. Um, and that so much of the drawing process is a gradual refinement and kind of cleaning up. And sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes it doesn't work, but um, for the most part, when I trust that it, that it does work, um, you know, it'll, it'll come together. You gotta, sometimes you just got to fight through a drawing. So blocking in the, the cast shadow as, as well. Uh, so if you're squinting as you're looking at the subject matter, that's what I'm doing as well. And, well, I'm squinting as well as blurring my vision. Uh, you, know, I, you know, sometimes you know, squinting will help to um, show you value relationships in a subject. Um, and it will diffuse the edges. It'll kind of blur things out. Um, but it, um, I, I feel like it's also helpful to kind of open your eyes wide and let your eyes lose focus. So you're letting a ton of light come in. You're flooding your eyes with light, um, but intentionally keeping the subject out of focus. And that can show you something about the form as well. So I'm kind of switching back and forth between squinting and opening my eyes wide to see these forms. Uh, Cleveland Lee is asking, is it best to draw things bigger than the normal size? Um, I, that is, that's going to be something that you'll determine works for you. Um, it is better for some people and it's not as well as others. So I think paying attention to the scale of your marks and what feels comfortable is really important. So I have kind of a scale of mark that's natural for me and that's going to lead to drawings that are certain size. Um, you know, and your scale might be different. Maybe you enjoy working larger or you enjoy working smaller. Um, the challenge with working smaller is that your proportions um, increasingly become more important the smaller you work. So if you're off by an eighth of an inch on a small drawing, proportionally, that's a, a, that's a large, it's a bigger issue than being off by an eighth of an inch on a large drawing. So that's just the one way I kind of think about it. Uh, so when you're working large, then one of the challenges then is just filling the page. Sometimes you find yourself um, just building up space. So I, the term I like to use is working at the speed of thought. So work at the size and the pace that aligns with how you process information. Um, I like, I, and this is what kind of works for me is this in the nine by 12, eight and a half by 11 size um, tends to work out well where I'm, uh, it's large enough to be a little bit forgiving in terms of those proportions, um, but not too large where I feel like I'm just filling in space and I'm not really contributing to drawing the form. Uh, Medieval Peasant is asking about art uh, competitions. We have several competitions on Artist Network. Uh, there's the Strokes of Genius competition, which is the drawing one. Um, there's the acrylic works, there's the artistic excellence that Artist Magazine puts on, um, there's watercolor, I believe, yeah, the splash uh, competition. There's a whole competitions page on artistnetwork.com, you'll find more there. I know they're opening up soon. And so you may be asking yourself, if you're new, um, you may be looking at the way I'm holding the pencil um, and, and it's, I'm being very intentional with holding my pencil on its side. So I use this grip here. I don't know what it's called. It's a more sort of modified overhand grip where I like to wedge it, the pencil between my fingers. I can stabilize it with these fingers and I'm still using the side of the pencil. So it, it gives me the control I would get if I were holding it like this, but I'm using the side of the pencil. When you switch your grip to a tripod grip, and you're really kind of engaging the tip, you're more likely to emboss the page, kind of create an embossed line and embed the material 
in the page. We want this to float on the surface, especially early on, and I don't need that fine control. And you'll learn of, over time that even using the side of the pencil, you have a lot of opportunities to, for creating detail and sharp edges. All right, so just building up these forms, trying to observe areas of light and dark. Edges are going to be really critical in this because if, if we follow along the edges in this drawing, you see that they disappear in some areas. If you look at this, for example, it's a very subtle value change between the white um, door and then the reflection. It's just a little bit darker in here. If you follow that edge, you know, it's crisp in some areas and highly visible and it just disappears in others. You follow up along this edge, for example, and it's really tricky right in there. All right, let me try to map out this main kind of reflection in here. I love seeing this curve. You know, it's the door itself being reflected in the sphere and it ends up kind of reflecting all the way around. So there's, a, there's this kind of point right in here where it kind of creates this heart-shaped curve. But I want to be careful with that line. You can see I, I've used a line to define that. Now I need to get rid of that. If I draw a line, that's an indication to the mind that that's the edge of the shape. It's the start of a new object. And it's not. This is this is a reflection on the same object. So that's why um, lines are really important to pay attention to because, um, again, they, they, they define the edges of objects most often. And so if, if I had mapped out this drawing too much by outlining the reflections, then I'd be constantly battling those lines and trying to get rid of those. Uh, so I would just need to be really careful with that. One of the advantages to toning the page first is that it helps to kind of, the term I use is season. It seasons the paper a bit. It just kind of prepares it for subsequent layers of charcoal so they, it blends a little bit better. So I think it's helpful to kind of build up a layer of charcoal if you're working in, in charcoal. All right, so that's starting to come together. Um, and at this point, we're able to see, we're kind of recognize the object. Um, and see the major kind of reflections. Um, and now it's really a matter of going through and kind of cleaning it up and adjusting. So let me see, I wanna, these directional marks here, kind of, they're distracting to, for me. So I wanna smooth these out. I'm gonna do some more cross hatching. So just change the direction of my marks. So I want that to read more like an even tone uh, and now you, you saw that I had erased out these lights. I'm not being super precious with them. It's really more for my mind to kind of make sure that I understand where they go. Um, you know, throughout the drawing process, I'll constantly be cleaning them up. Uh, I just, you know, for me, I, I found that when I when I draw in such a way where I, you know, I, if I finish one spot and then move on to another, and I'm constantly worried about protecting the spot that I just finished then that worry seeps into the whole drawing experience. It seeps into the drawing itself. Uh, it's less fun for me, and the drawing kind of displays a sense of control and not a sense of kind of comfort uh, that, that I think is really helpful. Oh, Nia is asking about pressure. Um, I'm really, and she's asking on a scale of one to 10, how much pressure am I using? I'm really using the weight of the pencil mostly. Um, that's one of the advantages to working on the side of, of the pencil. So I'm just using the weight of the pencil, rolling it between my fingers so that it's not creating these flat spots. Um, and then as I need to darken it, you know, I may kind of push that pressure up to two or three, um, but I'm, only, I'm gonna save my darkest darks for later when I have my 6B. Uh, so. Ah, Sue Eggert is also saying, yes, there's another one. There's, a, there's lots of competitions that we have. They're a lot of fun. So some amazing work that comes out of them. All right, so what do I want to do? Um, 
I think what I want to do is I need to clear my head a little bit before I dig in. Now I'm at the stage already where I can start to actually refine things. Um, and there's, this is going to be a large part of the drawing is, is, is this refinement because there's so many kind of details in it. Uh, but I think it's helpful to keep in mind that the, really the, what it, the challenge in a more complicated subject isn't in the strategy, it's in the attention, right? <laughs> it's like there's just more stuff to pay attention to, but you end up using the same strategy, the same techniques as you would with something that's very simple. So I, I, hopefully that just helps because I, I feel like sometimes students get intimidated by more complex things. There's just too much to do. But just know that if you can draw something very simple, you can draw something more complex. It's the same set of tools that you're using. You're just applying them to objects that are of, of a different scale. Um, and then the challenge for me is just my brain staying focused throughout it. You know, my, I, I can trust the skills that I have, but it's so easy to lose sight of the whole object when things become more complex. A medieval peasant is asking, what did I draw as a kid? Um, well, I was lucky enough, my parents did this thing. They, they painted a chalkboard. My, my, the lower half of my wall was a chalkboard as a kid growing up. And so I spent a lot of time drawing on that. Um, and that actually is something I think about a lot when I draw, because I, I like to think of the drawing process as very fluid and flexible. Like the idea you could just you could build it up and you can wipe it down, you can draw again. And that's very, um, that's built out of the idea of drawing with chalk, something that's less permanent. Um, and I would draw all sorts of things, you know, as a, a boy, I was drawing a lot of tanks and war scenes. <laughs> I love to draw stone walls, the idea of drawing these little pieces that kind of stick, fit together. Um, and, you know, draw things like robots and spaceships. You know, I didn't, nothing, uh, all that revolutionary as a kid. I think I drew what everybody else drew, but I did do a lot of drawing um, on that chalkboard. Uh, Wanton Noodles is asking, um, when will you be satisfied with the refinements? Like, how will you know when it's done? That's a really good question. It's something we talk about in the series as well. The one of the reasons I like to draw in this way, the idea of building up the whole drawing at once, is that it puts me in control of when the drawing is done. You know, the idea is that at any point I should be able to stop and recognize what I'm what I'm drawing. You know, somebody could look at this and say, "Oh, I see that as a doorknob, and I understand certain reflections." Um, and so. And then within that, like I can continue to work on this for as long as I'd like. And sometimes that's just kind of a pure feeling based on the experience that I'd like to have. Sometimes I just want to have that experience of sitting with something, using that high concentration to really refine those details. Some days I'm just antsy and my arm is just full of energy and I need to move it and I don't want to get bogged down in those details. So I like to listen to that feeling. Um, and then also, you know, if I'm doing a drawing for a class or, um, you know, for somebody else, then, you know, that would dictate when it's done. You know, is it, uh, is it displaying what needs to be displayed? All right, so I'm going to, uh, hopefully that makes sense. Um, we're, but we'll kind of talk about that as, at some point I'm going to decide when this is done and, and I can talk through, you know, what I'm thinking about at that time. Um, so I have my blending stump and I'm going to start to bring this out and kind of smooth out some of the marks. But remember, and I know you, you, all, you all that have been with me for a while are probably getting sick of hearing me say this, but your tools are always an opportunity to refine, refine your form. And so this is a blending stump and it's designed to smooth out your marks, but it's an also, also an opportunity to correct form, to refine it and make a statement about what you're observing. Uh, so don't forget that. Um, so I'm constantly kind of questioning the proportions. This is just loading up the, and kind of loading up the uh, blending stump with the uh, with the charcoal over here. 
there's this really cool thin reflection right in here that I need to figure out how to address. I'm going to come back to that. Um, in part because there's actually a reflection in the shadow. It's, a, it's knocked down. It's not quite as intense as the other reflections. So I want to come back to that. Ahmed is asking if I use Fabriano paper. I have um, for some watercolor work, and it's amazing stuff. But I should try it for drawing. So as I'm, you know, as I'm using this blending stump, and now I'm switching, it's, it, because it's so loaded with charcoal, I can use it as a tool to actually make marks. And so that's kind of what I'm doing now. Um, So a bit of, bit of extra concentration. One of the things I'm observing is I see these reflections in here. Again, they're ellipses, not circles, and my brain wants to make them circles so bad right now. <laughs> and so I have to fight that instinct and really observe the specific shape in that they're kind of elongated. Um, have so, much of, so much of drawing can feel like you're just kind of fighting instincts. Um, and that's because our brain is designed to overlook the specifics of how things actually look. You know, when I look at this doorknob, my brain takes in all that optical information about the, how the light is reflecting, what the proportions are, you know, the values, colors, all that. It's just the raw visual data, the brain is taking that in as an electrical signal um, and then is processing it and it's thinking, oh, what is that? It defines it as a doorknob. It tells us that it's an object that can be turned and releases a latch that opens the door. Um, it brings up memories of doorknobs in the past. And then what, it, what the brain then sends to our conscious mind is doorknob in its function. It takes all of that visual information um, that used to get to that conclusion and it keeps it locked in its subconscious because it's not really necessary for us in terms of functioning in the world. We don't need to understand the raw optical data in order to move throughout the world. And in some ways, that would actually confine us. I mean, if we were to look at this door, if we're walking up to this door and we, and we pause, look at it, take 30 minutes to, to study each and every individual kind of optical detail, then come to the conclusion that that's a doorknob, our lives would be um, challenging. And so it, our brain processes all that information for us and it sends the signal to the conscious mind, this is a doorknob, that's all you need to know. And, but then when we get, it, we get to drawing and our brain is thinking doorknob and we and we're start to draw from that preconceived notion of what a doorknob is or kind of a symbol for a doorknob rather than all that optical information that our brain has been trained to to overlook or get past very quickly. So what we're doing throughout the drawing process is paying attention to that raw data, building a drawing uh, that's recognizable for the viewer so that their brain accepts it as a doorknob and tells them doorknob, not all the optical information. They're not looking at all the details. They're not looking at all the visual cues that tell us them what that is. Their, their brain is going through the same process that ours does when we, when we encounter it. So. Um, that's the, the challenge here is that, you know, we, there's stuff happening, happening optically that our brain is intentionally ignoring and we have to tell the brain, pay attention. All right. So I'm just, I'm going to start to refine some of these negative spaces, looking at these reflections. I'm intentionally keeping these edges soft especially with like this reflection here, that edge variation is gonna be really critical. There's gonna be some areas that are sharper, some that are softer. But we, you know, we often take kind of for granted, you know, when, we're, when we know we're drawing something that's highly reflective, our brain naturally wants to make everything sharp, and very clean, um, but yeah, as, as you can observe in this, there are some reflections that are very sharp with sharp edges and some that are much softer. So really pay close attention to which ones are soft, which ones are harder. All right. I'm going to come back in here and 
continue to refine it. And there's this kind of darker shape here. And before I go to an area and lighten it up, I like to do double check and, and darken the areas around it. So, you know, as I'm looking at this area, I recognize this as being lighter than this. And so my instinct right now is to actually lighten this up. But before I do that, I want to darken the area around it, and then I can evaluate if it's the right value. All right, let's see. It looks like this right in here is the reflection of the doorknob itself. Huh, something like that. I don't really know what some of these reflections are. You can actually see me down in here. I was trying to get out of the way, <laughs> and I didn't do a very good job, but you can see me kind of peeking around a corner because I wanted to get the right angle of this doorknob. You know, some cool scratches on that doorknob that, you know, I'm not going to... I'll play around with it, see if I can suggest them using the, the charcoal display, letting it just kind of scrape across the surface. Now there's some areas that I know I'm going to come back to and darken up. This shape's not quite right. I'm looking at this kind of negative shape in here. And I need to darken this. I'm, gonna, I'm kind of losing this hole that has the screw. Um, one of the things that, especially in the early, the, in the preparatory drawing, I found myself doing was try to address some of the finer details. There's like a thin white line along this edge. Um, and I found myself really battling that throughout the drawing. So I'm intentionally leaving that out for now, and then I'm going to try to add that in a little bit later. Uh, Sophia, welcome back to drawing. You're saying that you've taken some time off. You're back at it. That's awesome. Um, I really love drawing. I don't do enough of it. That's one of the reasons I started this whole series um, when we all found ourselves being uh, indoors more <laughs> than we had probably hoped. Um, I recognize that this is a good opportunity to kind of hone those skills, but I'm, I, I really enjoy oil painting. That's kind of what, what I come back to the most. I do a lot of plein air oil painting. So one of the things I can observe here, there's this dark form that kind of uh, is consistent through these three of these dark shapes. They're kind of interrupted by this lighter, um, this lighter highlight, but there's this kind of dark form right in here. Yeah, these, these edges are quite, quite soft at, at this point, and eventually we're going to go through and sharpen them up. right in here I think that we could really kind of sharpen that up but I want to be I want to be mindful because maybe there's some areas that I don't want to sharpen up I want to keep relatively loose I'm going to build up the drawing all together at once and then kind of keep going back in and refining areas Um, so to kind of answer your question too, like I, I jo enjoy painting in oils, and that definitely informs how I draw. I tend to have more of, I guess, a painterly approach to drawing, a painter's approach to drawing. So um, it's just something to kind of keep in mind. You know, we, and that's what I like about the series that we get to share 
our, you know, each of our own kind of ways of thinking about drawing and pulling these drawings together. Let's see, just checking here. Oh no, Nia's saying, I accidentally used the tip of my tortillion instead of the side and some of the cotton from my paper is lifted up. Oh yeah, <laughs> these things do get beat up um, a bit. Um, and I, there's a comment too about the value of the, uh, the cast shadow. Yeah, that's definitely something that we'll continue to look at throughout the drawing. So as we expand the value range, um, you know, we're gonna have to adjust things because even these dark areas, I know I can go darker with the 6B. So I'm kind of gradually building up. I'm going to just kind of rough in these shapes here. This kind of cool little doorway. You can see the hall reflected in this area here. You know, details. Detail is something that I've been considering a lot lately um, because it's really easy to get to get to a point where you're, we kind of take detail for granted in, in the sense that we just assume that drawings need it. Um, and I have to kind of remind myself that some of my favorite drawings are not very detailed. So early on, one of the artists I really liked a lot was uh, Georges Seurat who did these, you know, he's the pointillist painter who created the, the picnic in Paris there, that scene, got the monkey in it and the girl. Um, and he does these wonderful Conte drawings uh, that I just think are full of life and light and I really loved what, what he was doing there. And you see some other, other artists that are highly detailed and it gets, it's really in, like attractive. It makes, makes me want to do that too. But I, I, what I keep coming back to is that marks are thoughts, right? You know, so, you know, it's, it, these are all, all these marks that we're making are expressions of our thoughts about the subject and whatever's happening throughout the day. Um, and then drawings become a way of expressing that and that we each have our own, uh, our own set of thoughts that are unique to us. And so our drawings should be unique to us as well. I'm going to keep building up those values. That's got to get quite a bit darker, but I want to start to smooth things out a little bit. So what I want to try to do is establish that, that, that reflection of light there coming through that, from that back door. I really like using the blending stump to do that because it helps me to think in terms of shape rather than line. I don't want to outline these forms in the reflection. I want them to be treated as shapes again, because an, an outline, or a contour line defines the edge of an object. So when we see too many lines, it, it's hard for our brain to process that information. We want to treat all of those lines as separate objects rather than one, one object. And so as I'm doing this, I, I'm trying to orient this blending stump in a way that I'm um, there's less pressure facing in towards that reflection, a little bit more pressure on the outer edge. And if then it kind of softens, it softens that edge a little bit going into that highlight, into that reflection. This is going to be a little bit darker down in here. I'm going to have to, I'm going to refine that a little bit more. Adele is asking, does the shadow on the knob go a little bit lower? Yeah, potentially. I should. I'll have to look at that again. Yeah. 
or are you talking about this, this part right in here? That's If that's the part you're looking at, I was just observing that as I'm looking at this negative space here, this feels too, too big. So I wanna first make sure that this line here is correct. Is that, that feels like a circle. And then uh, right in here, I can drop this down. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, and then if you're new, just know that I welcome these observations. So if you see anything that's off, any proportions that need to be adjusted, let me know. All right, so we've kind of done another pass at this drawing now, and we're gonna continue to go through and refine. So one of, as, I'm, as I'm looking at the shapes in this reflection, what threw me off before is that I was seeing this dark shape separately from the larger doorknob form. And that was really throwing me off. I kind of kept confusing the two. And so I, when I'm looking at the reference photo, I'm trying to take measurements based on both of those. So as I look at some of these darker forms, look at it in the context of this larger shape, then also make sure that it's in the right spot relative to the whole doorknob. I'm just going to suggest some of these forms in here. And then we're going to take another pass and we're going to clean this up even farther, but it's starting to get there. And Nia is saying you've been studying Van Gogh. Awesome. Ahmed is asking about clouds in acrylic. Ooh, that's a big one. Uh, we do have some videos on Artist Network about painting clouds, so that they I would kind of defer to them, but um, I don't paint a whole lot in acrylics. The biggest challenge, the, the thing that, that kind of really helped open my eyes to painting clouds was to question how white they are. <laughs> like, and that's one of those things where our brain says, oh, it's a cloud, it's white. We want to make them white but they're most often not, you know, so really kind of study those values. Um, and, and in particular, try to determine the value relationship between the cloud and that blue sky next to it. Um, and really study that relationship. All right, so I'm gonna kind of go through now, really kind of refine some of these. So we've got this thin light in here. I'm gonna use the edge of this harder eraser um, to kind of draw it out. And now I'm, I know that I'm most likely going to overstate it, I'm gonna make it wider than it actually is. And I'll try to keep it a thin line. And it's not a, it's not a heavy pressure. It's really just the weight of the, of the eraser. How does that work? That works out okay. I'm gonna leave that as it is. Um, gonna come back under here and there's a little bit of a darker edge that's relatively soft. So I'm gonna, gonna darken that a little bit. And then I'm gonna use my kneaded eraser for some of these shapes right in here. Now I wanna be careful because I don't want that to be brighter than that highlight. So I really need to evaluate those two and it does feel like it's brighter. So I've got some charcoal built up on my finger there so I can just kind of lightly knock that down um, and then build it up again. And I just kind of know from enough drawing experience that <laughs> like you draw something over and over and over again. And each time you do, you're gonna get a little bit better. Um, so I get this highlight here just to see what that lightest light is going to be. And I want to make sure that that light there is not as, as, not as bright as that one. And I feel like it's still too 
too light. I'm going to knock this down. And then I'm going to bring this. My, this is my 6B now. So rather than lightening this area up even more, I'm going to actually darken the values around it to increase the contrast, but keep the value there noticeably darker than the value there. And then right in here, I can refine this shape here with this 6B. And then I kind of work from the center of the object up to the edge to sharpen that edge. So rather than from the edge in, I'm building up to it. I'm still trying to use the side of the pencil here, and that kind of preserves that sharp point. I see some kind of negative drawing in here as I work on these shadow shapes here. And What do we think of that? I think that's working out okay. Mark V is saying when you stand back and look, you got to do over. Oh no, <laughs> but I'm really glad that you're standing back and checking it out from a distance. That's really important. Um, it's something that we forget to do a lot and it's so easy to get caught up in the drawing. I do that all the time. A medieval peasant is asking, do I prefer to draw in natural light, or studio light? I am lucky enough that I have a pretty bright studio light here. Um, that works out pretty well. Drawing is less critical for me in terms of the lighting. You know, painting is another thing. I think working with a some sort of full spectrum bulb is really helpful. Um, painting outdoors, I like. I like the light. Painting outdoors. Just adding a, trying to use that, that sharp edge of the eraser to kind of get that, that little highlight along the edge of this hole. Fluorescent lights are just tricky to, to draw or paint in. So I'm just working on this reflection here, kind of refining this one here. Um, so I kind of want a sharper edge, but I want to be careful not to outline it. So I'm keeping those marks right up along the edge, very gentle. And then right in here, there's, I need to kind of drop this dark reflection here. How we feel about that feels all right. Okay. All right, just checking to see if there's any questions. Not seeing any, so I'm going to keep moving. I'm going to do my best to keep talking, although this is definitely the stage where I'm starting to concentrate a little bit more. It's a little bit more challenging to talk while I draw. What I want to do is, I, th this bugs me here that it's not quite sharp enough. So here, what I'm going to use is the, this harder eraser. And I'm just going to kind of tap, kind of just gently kind of jiggle along that edge. And I don't want that, I don't want it to be too strong. 
I don't want to lift off too much material, but I do want to kind of just sharpen that edge up a little bit. So, um, and then there is some kind of variation in this form. Like this feels really flat right now. So I want to kind of observe kind of the, there's this kind of flow to the material in here. Ah, this needs to go up here. And this is one of the challenges with charcoal. It doesn't quite give you as precise an edge as graphite can, as you know, because graphite is just a harder material. It's going to give you that sharper edge, but I think that's all right. Again, I. I think sometimes a, a, a drawing with reflections um, can suffer from being too sharp, too crisp. All right. So now I want to kind of go back in and do similar what to technique as I used in this highlight here. Is we've got this thin light in here that I've made too big. It really narrows down there. I'm going to lift that off. I'm going to wipe it down. I want to knock that value down so it's not quite as intense. And then I'm going to work my way in to find that edge. So switching back and forth between positive and negative drawing. This, this gets really dark in here. All right, that feels pretty good. Okay, so then I'm just doing a quick check-in to evaluate the, how intense these reflections are. I don't want to overstate them. So um, I feel like that's pretty good. I can always lift them off a little bit more. It bugs me how, the, how diffused that is. So I want to sharpen up this light a little bit. And I'll knock that down. Build up that haze. It doesn't take much at all to knock a value down just a little bit. Um, you know, one thing we didn't really talk about, you know, kind of take for granted that, you know, the terms value or tone. So if you have any questions about that, feel free to kind of shout out. You know, one of the reasons that we, one of the things I do when choosing these subjects is I'm looking for things that are intentionally challenging because that's how, that's how we grow as artists is to challenge ourselves. And so, of course, this one here, the challenge is, you know, the reflection. There's all sorts of other things. Um, Uh, Lindy is asking about using an eraser that's shaped like a pencil. I've never actually used one, but I certainly have seen them, and that perhaps it's something I should get. I like that idea. And they definitely make like the, the mechanical erasers that are um, kind of sharper and more detailed. But I don't often do work that's this detailed. It's very rare for me to really get into these tight spots like I am right now. Um, so. Is this the 6B? Yes, it's the 6B. Got that, oh, this is kind of cool, the, the, the way the light hits that screw head in there. Um, I'm gonna use my kneaded eraser to kind of lift off some of that light in there. Uh, and then Lindy, Linda is asking about the value behind here. Yeah, I might need to knock that down. So if I pull back the, the original drawing that I did, I did, 
that's what happened here so much. I left the white of the page way too long and then I kept trying to build up value. And it was just, I, I found that it was too challenging to do it after the fact, or more challenging than I needed it to be. And so I started with the tone paper here to help combat that. But I do think you, I, we have to drop the value down a little bit on, on a, in that background. But I wanna wait until I've built up the darks in the rest of the drawing and I can evaluate the contrast against that highlight uh, before I make that call. Because at this point, it's somewhat of an arbitrary decision to drop it uh, to a certain degree. I, I mean, I, I do feel like it does need to be dropped down, but I don't know by how much. And so I want to give myself a little bit more information. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, there's that highlight here. I feel like that was working out pretty well, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna add that dark line and then cut back into it. Whew, this one's taking a while, but we're getting there. So, we are getting there. I just want to read through some of these questions here. Uh, okay, it looks like it's... Uh, let's see, what's the difference between still life drawing and drawing from the phone? So I'm working from a photograph because that is what works best for this series. But whenever possible, I think working from life is going to give you a far greater challenge and, and better results. Um, you're going to learn more um, by working from life, I think, always. Um, you know, of course, I'm, if I think about it more, I could probably qualify that a little bit more and question whether or not it always is really the key word, but um, I, I just I highly recommend working from life when you can. Um, and it's not always, uh, not always possible, so you just do the best you can. But, you know, in terms of developing your skills, um, and I am doing this because I, I want to build up hand-eye coordination that will hopefully apply to um, my painting on location because I do all my painting directly from life. I, I am challenged when working from photographs when painting. Um, so I tend to work from life more. All right, I do want to drop the value down in here. I'm gonna make this highlight in here more distinct. So I'm gonna lower the value. I think the whole the value in the whole drawing could be dropped a bit. Alright, that's that's creating more contrast. Really gonna pop that highlight, but I can really see it here. Uh, let me get this, kind of made this highlight too large. But that's all right, because I can come back in and refine it. That feels a little bit better, and then I'm going to keep darkening this even more. Let me grab the four. This is the, the HB, I mean. Is that right? Uh, Joy is asking about using white charcoal to pull out the highlights. We could give that a shot. Um, I did not do that for the preparatory drawing. Um, and then one of the challenges with that is the temperature of the white can vary. Um, 
you know, I think really the white of the paper is the best white that you can uh, find. Uh, but you know, we've we've used that before in, in the past with some of these charcoal drawings. Brought in some white um, charcoal. We'll give that a shot. I want to kind of clean this edge here up. All right, I want to come back in here and kind of clean this edge. We really lose it right along this edge here. It's, it's a bit tricky, so I'm just using the, the eraser to kind of I don't know, play around with that edge. I need to, need to think about it more. Right in here. So I think what I'm going to do is kind of work my way from the outer edge in. And I want to pay attention to this edge variation. I don't want that to be a consistent edge. I want it to be constantly changing. Uh, I want that lost and found edge. Let's see, I think I can sharpen this edge up a little bit. Just using the eraser, kind of just pulling away from that edge and just checking to make sure it's not creating a, an artificial halo that's too noticeable. All right, what do I have? I've got the HB now still. Um, so again, to try to avoid using a line in here, what I'm trying to visualize is the path and then kind of set the pencil in along that path and pull inward rather than draw a line that's too harsh. Um, oh, Marianne is asking a good question about value in terms lightning. I like to, when I, when I go darker, I'm dropping the value. When I'm, when I go lighter, I'm raising it. And I'm, to be honest, I'm not sure if that's the way everybody else uses it. So <laughs> um, it, it may be kind of an inverted way of thinking about it. Uh, so it'd be interesting to see how you all conceive of that. But when I say, um, uh, when I'm you know, dropping the value, I'm going darker. So this is a lot of just kind of tight work, but I'm not really doing anything fundamentally different here than in any other drawing. Um, so I think that's kind of important to keep in mind. We often will um, you know, we'll approach new subjects as though we're as though you we would draw them completely differently. And again, drawing is a it, there's a kind of a set of decisions you make as an artist when drawing. And those decisions happen in any subject, you know, for the most part. Um, and so trust that. Trust that you know that. Um, and you're applying those same decisions, you know, if it's, you know, something simple like a cup. It's the same set of decisions as something that's more complex like this. But try not to let yourself become intimidated by it and change the way you draw because you think it has to be drawn in a different way. I really need to go darker in here and make a sharper kind of point of light in this primary reflection here. And kind of choosing to be more direct with these marks and perhaps sacrificing some correct proportions for that kind of direction, that direct mark um, is perhaps a bit more bold. And because um, I think ultimately it's going to convey as light more effectively.
So I'm just using the blending stump now as a drawing tool to refine some of those forms. Because I, I do kind of like that soft edge, it kind of it helps me to kind of feather it into that hot, that light, that kind of diffused edge that the light creates. Um, and the way the the edge is treated really does a lot to tell the the viewer's mind that, that that's light, that's bright light. Um, in the past, I, I often would create ed drawings that had just had too sharp of an edge, and I would lose that. Um, it becomes too artificial, in a way. So it's harder for them, the viewer's mind, to accept it as reality. Got to be careful with the direction of my marks. I don't want them to be too diagonal. All right, and then we're going to go. This is just done with the HB, so we're going to go back in with a 6B and really add even more dark. But looking at it from a distance now, I guess I'm looking at the screen that's in front of me here that shows the overhead projection. Um, I'm just evaluating to make sure that that feels like it's still, that's holding together. Um, let's see. Do you want, I'm kind of losing this edge a little bit too much. Kind of all over the place on my stool here, so. <laughs> But I'm trying not to get into the shot too much. Okay. What do I have? Ah, I need the 6B. That's what I've got. Here we go. Let's see. This is kind of a sharper edge down in here. Not a high contrast edge. It's not a big difference between light and dark. It's just a sharper edge. You see how much darker that goes, and it kind of goes back to what I was saying very early in the in the drawing. When working with values, one of the things that we have to confront is the mind's natural desire to calibrate to the the value range. And so my brain had started interpreting this as black when it isn't. It's actually much lighter than it's possible. And so by expanding that value range, increasing that tonal range, um, it really adds to the the drawing. How's everybody doing? Everybody holding up okay? If you're following along. Um, as Effie is asking, value is local value or the same thing? Um, so there are kind of two ways to think about value. So value refers to how light or dark something is. You know, the term for that is tone. Um, so uh, you have, you know, think about the value scale, it's going from from black to white with all the grays in between. And the local value is, is the value of an object in the same, if you can, there's an also, a similar term called local color, and it's very similar. So local color and local value refer to the object as unaffected by light. And so the local value is the value of the object um, if, you, if you don't pay attention to how light is affecting it, because an object, um, you know, it, it changes its optical value based on the lighting conditions. And so then the other term that I use is, is that term, optical value. There's, there's the value that we understand it to be, and then there's the optical value, what it actually looks like based on the way light is being um, interpreted by your, your brain. Um, so in general, you know, if you're going for realism, paying attention to the optical value is critical. And the same with uh, you know the same with with color you know again we have the you have the local color and then you have the optical color and so you know there's you take a take a red apple and its local color is going to be that red you change the lighting source and it's going to change that color the red as that um, as affected by the light but your brain does a lot of calibration for that it will It'll interpret that optical information and tell your conscious mind what the local uh, 
what the local value is or what the local color is because that's often actually more helpful to you. If that makes sense. Our brain solves a lot for us. <laughs> so the so drawing process is a, way, is a way to help us get to that. Um, this is cool little, I don't know what's going on down in here. There's the, these little marks that I'm just gonna trust. All right, now there was a question earlier about darkening the background and I do feel like it needs to go darker. Um, so let me see in particular how I wanna do that. I'm gonna take the HB and I'm just going to be building up really kind of fine layers of value to kind of drop the value. And I'm rolling the pencil in my fingers so that I'm not flattening it out, not creating any flat spots. I'm not being super careful with that edge. I can clean that up if I need to. What I worry about are those halos that I've talked about before where if I try to just get right in there and I change the, the pace and the direction of my marks as I lead up to that edge, the eye will perceive that and it'll actually flatten out the drawing. So I'm going to go right over that edge not preserve it, and then try to redefine it again. I can feel the, 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 the um, charcoal scratching the paper right now. There's a hard spot in it that is it's scratching it. So um, Roberto, it would be cool to do a Halloween-based drawing. I've got a couple skulls. Uh, we did a skull not too recently, I mean, uh, you know, not too long ago, uh, and, and we did a skull early on, so there's actually two skulls, that's probably the closest um, in terms of a Halloween subject. Uh, next week we're working on drawing an autumn leaf, uh, that's a fun one, I just started that, and it's a challenge. Uh, so one of the things I'm thinking about as I as I lay in marks in that background is I want those marks to uh, have a different direction than the than the contour of the object. So um, I'm running these vertical like uh, as straight diagonal lines to contrast against the curve of that sphere. This is kind of too soft in here, so I'm just going to sharpen up this edge. So just kind of placing the eraser up along that edge and then just kind of pulling away. And I created that halo. Actually kind of works a little bit. There is a bit of reflected light, light kind of bouncing in on the side of this plate onto that wall, but I don't want that to, I don't want that to be a thing. All right, so how do we feel about that? I feel like that works out all right. From a distance, I think it holds up. I don't know if there's a whole lot more I can really do to that, to this, um, that's gonna show you anything new. Um, so I think I'm at the point where we can call it good. Um, we do meet every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern. So if this is your first time with us, welcome, and we hope to see you again. Uh, check out artistnetwork.com where, uh, you can find links in the description below where you can find the individual show pages. We're at episode, what, 70, 71, 72? <laughs> We've got a lot of them. Um, and you can browse there for different subjects um, and uh, you know, find what works for you. There is no real kind of order to these. You know, they're non-sequential, so hop in wherever you'd like. But if you would like to follow in order, the playlist on, on um, YouTube has them structured in order, so check that out. Um, let me see. I feel like this is working out pretty well. I'm happier with this than the first one I did. Um, I think the first one was a little bit cleaner, um, but I feel like the value control is a little bit stronger on this one. Um, so if we look at this one, for example, um, higher contrast, brighter background. Um, I feel like the form is off a bit. This feels better. I think proportionally it feels better. Um, Value-wise, I think it's just a stronger drawing. But I think I think there are some areas where I might continue to refine. Um, you know, right in this area, for example, it feels like that that tooth of the paper is too strong, so I kind of smooth this out. 
Um, but again, if you're following this process, the idea is that if you build the whole drawing up at once, uh, you, you're in control of when you finish it. So we can go back to that question earlier, how do you know when you're done? Uh, one of the things I like to consider is, am I really contributing to the form? Have I, am I learning anything new about the drawing or am I just filling in material? Um, and in general, that's, that's a, 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 a point at which, you know, if I'm not, if I've learned really all I can about this subject and the stuff that I'm doing isn't telling me more about the subject, but it's just kind of adding detail, that's when I like to dial it back and I, kind of, I start to really slow down and maybe stop the drawing altogether. Um, because I, I don't want to lose too much kind of freshness in it. I really like drawings that are, you know, become a little bit sketchier. You know, this is more refined than I think I do some other drawings. Uh, and, but the, um, you know, it all comes down to, you know, what am I, is this expressing my understanding of the subject? And, um, and if so, I'm like, all right, then I can, I can call it quits. The rest is just, just labor. And sometimes I don't want to do that work, <laughs> to be honest. Sometimes it just, it's just work. Um, oh, there's a little highlight here I need to pull out. So, uh, well, I hope you all have enjoyed it. Whew, this was a, this was a tough one, but we got it done an hour and a half. So I think I'm feeling pretty good about it. I just want to read through the, the, um, read through the, the comments here, make sure I haven't missed anything. So I'll hang on for a little bit. Um, again, this does go up as a recording afterwards. So if you were just watching and you want to follow along again, um, you're more than uh, welcome to do that. Uh, I'd love to see your drawings on Artist Network. So follow the link in the description to the show page where you can do that. Um, it's awesome to see all of those drawings. Um, Nia is asking about colored pencils. I was just talking, so we are developing a new um, YouTube series with an artist named Gigi Chen. She's gonna be doing some acrylic painting. So that's gonna be starting up later this month. So I've been working with that, um, working with her on that. And we were just talking about colored pencils because she does some amazing colored pencil work. Um, and I have, I struggle with that a little bit because my brain wants to use it like, like a pastel um, and more like painting than drawing. And it's somewhere kind of in between. I need to find that right balance. So I'm gonna keep working with colored pencil and hopefully do a colored pencil demonstration. But I wanna make sure that when I, when I do that, that I'm feeling more confident and that I can contribute to the conversation. Right now, I feel like I'm floundering a little bit with a colored pencil because it's such a challenging medium. Um, and I just need to, to find the way that I work with it um, and come to it with some sort of confidence. So, um, so thank you so much. I think we're going to call it, um, appreciate all of the comments here. And I see a bunch coming in right now, so I'm hanging out for a little bit <laughs> just to make sure I'm, I get them all. Um, but it looks like it stopped now. So, all right. Thank you all. I will see you next Monday. Have a Wednesday, have a great weekend, and I can't wait to see your next drawing.